I doubt this thing has gotten fired up in at least 10 years, maybe longer. I've been filming videos at a normal pace lately, but I've canned most of them and decided to use the footage for, like, they haven't been quite good enough. However, at the end of this video, I'll put one of the videos that I threw away and I'll re-edit for this. I'm just not quite happy with it. And that's kind of how I am with a lot of these things. I've started keeping these notes for products to make. And, uh, I have some good ideas. For instance, my dad, he has a CNC laser cutter now, a plasma cutter, and I can make like a, a J or an F clamp if I get the right idea. A little pocket wooden um, lumber pencil and lumber crayon holders, a right, nice ornate little item I can make to sell. Step stools, made to be cheap, also made to be nice. Little rechargeable battery holders, made to be cheap, made to be nice. A special saw to cut lumber. All these ideas. But again, just something about it. It's just not good enough. Just like those videos. And so I decided to flip it over and write some structure to my rules. To bring structure and quality to the things I make. Number one, it is best to do more with less, low impact on earth. Number two, objects are better to us when they are held and when they hold meaning a story or uniqueness. Things should last as many years as possible. Lubrication and cleaning should be expected, but a part should never need replaced. Mass production is great, but lowering quality is a failure. Never add a part you don't need. Be mindful of material choice and how it affects the user's mood. You can learn how to make something by hand, but you won't be able to share your skills like you could share a machine. Build your skills into an automated machine and what you learned will outlive you. A product should never aim to be overpriced. Most price elevations are due to unthoughtful manufacturing or too many middlemen. Take your time thinking up an elegant solution. Don't settle for the first or second idea. Don't hoard, hoard your ideas. Patents are the game of the greedy. You should be a wellspring of innovation, not a defensive one-hit wonder. You have an ethical duty to spread what you learn. If a product does not improve the world in, in any way, you shouldn't make it. If it is worth enough to make, it is worth enough to spread. Rules should guide you, but never limit you. A written wisdom to help you not get you lost. If you, if you feel limited by a rule, seek where the problem lies. I know these ones aren't worded as well, but these are also kind of just, well, these are all rules to me. Don't forget the reward for a good work is only a fraction of the reward for a good life. Many greedy people will claim that work is all you need, you can only keep your humanity and passion if you have other things which bring you bring value, joy, and direction to your life. You must not get lost in work if you ever if you are to continue being creative. I find it hard to describe, but I need to draw inspiration from so many things to stay on track. And lastly, do not get fixated on money, nor let yourself see things, only for the value to others. There are more forms of payment than money, also, such as favors or things. Lastly, losing money shouldn't make you feel as bad as the modern world would want you to. You only need so much, and you can always make more. They print more every day. So I've been thinking, since I, I am at a point right now where I'm kind of building a business, I want to make sure my ethos is right. So one, it is best to do more with less low impact on Earth. In general, it's, it's, it's just a good idea, because whenever I'm thinking about something, I want to make sure that I'm using... Well, especially if I'm using material that's maybe discarded by some company or left over from some other process. Like if I make packing material out of sawdust, that's a that's a double win. It's cheap and it's repurposing something. Objects are better to us when they hold meaning, a story, or uniqueness. That's what a lot of things lack. Things that you can buy off the shelf these days, they they lack a story. Whereas if something's homemade or handmade, or at least has like a neat brand to it or something. It has a story and a uniqueness. Because that that's when I was wondering, why would somebody buy a push stick or something from me? Well, it's going to be handmade. It's going to have a story. It's going to have something nice in it. And it's that story that also kind of brings value. Because then 
whatever I make doesn't have to just be whatever I make. It can be that plus the story that I kind of write into it. Things should last as many years as possible. Lubrication and cleaning should be expected, but a part should never need replaced. I don't like the idea that things should always have to have things replaced on them. Sure, I understand capacitors and such go bad, but you should try to use capacitors that last longer. You should try to use bearings that can be lubricated and won't fail so badly. I'm not a fan of the way to fix a car is just to throw away a part and replace it. That's kind of like a failure. The better way to fix it is if you could like like uh, put it on a lathe and fix it and actually then put that part back in your vehicle. Mass production is great, but lowering quality is a failure. I wrote this one because I had a hard time figuring out, well, I like mass production because if I have something great, I want a bunch of people to be able to have that. So what is the actual issue that I have with like factories and such? And it's just that it has lower quality. And because in order to get the lower quality, they also throw away the story and the uniqueness. So I realized that it's actually quite different. It's not that I hate mass production. I just hate whenever they allow the quality to be lowered and never add a part you don't need. Well, that kind of speaks for itself. That's something that should be done in every industry because parts you don't need, they cost everybody. They weigh us down. And uh, it's how we get things that are an unelegant design. And I might make a different video about this someday. Be mindful of material choice and how it affects the user's mood. This is something kind of important. Like look at that wooden floor down there. It, it has a certain mood that it invokes in me. It's a nice beautiful floor from 1919. Put in this house in 1920. And it gives a certain atmosphere. And anytime you make something, you have to be mindful of what that atmosphere it gives off. Like whenever I look at an old hand plane, like a woodworker's hand plane, a lot of those have really nice wooden handles. And that, that looks like a, a place where my hand would gladly go instead of like a, a metal or a rubber handle. That, that wood is just very inviting for some reason. And I think material choice is a very important thing. That's why you always have like on luxury cars you have wood on the on the steering wheel or on the gear, gear shifter or whatever because materials are very important and if I'm gonna make anything I have to make sure that I don't forget that like if I go down the rabbit hole and start uh, ma making a plastics recycling thing where I'm injection molding things well plastic isn't good for everything like um, it might be okay for a power drill but not always you just have to keep that in mind so if I'm ever going to be thinking of a product, I want to keep that in mind. And this one. This is the one that I think is the best because you really do need to make sure that what you learn goes on beyond you. Because if you can, in, you can, if you can put your skill into a machine, then anybody can use that machine. The person who invented the, the lathe, the mechanical lathe in the 1850s, like what, Vukasan or whatever his name was, he pretty much took that skill of making something round and gave it to all of us. We no longer have to sit there for two days and hand file something down to roundness. We can just put it on the lathe and now that he's given that skill to all of us we can make something round and we can make our own ball bearings and races and all this stuff. And that's pretty beautiful because it is kind of like in a, a video game whenever you learn a new spell and you learn something magical. You learn, or you, get, you gain the ability of whatever that person encoded into that machine. And I think that one also speaks for itself. A product should never aim to be overpriced. Because why are things overpriced? Greed, middlemen, and unthoughtful manufacturing. A lot of unthoughtful manufacturing. Because people are just inefficient. They don't care to find ways to reduce costs. You see that a lot in automobiles. Definitely do. And this is another one. Take your time thinking of an elegant solution. Don't settle for the first or second idea. Now, of course, you could settle for the first or second idea if you happen to have intuition that got you the best one. But this was just bringing to mind um, a talk that John Cleese gave about creativity that I thought was really interesting. Because he, he, sa he said that the, the originality of his skits that he wrote 
was more based upon how long he waited to come up with the best idea. He, he, he waited past that, that, that time of being uncomfortable and uh, like kind of held the idea on his head without just like jumping towards like, oh, the first solution. And he, he kept himself in that state of seeking a better way. And he didn't let himself just fall to the first solution just so he could say it was over with. And that led him to have some of the most creative, creative choices or whatever you'd call it. Now these are a little more personal. Some people might disagree with me, but I happen to find that making things open source is a really good idea. I don't like the idea of patents because I feel like Again, you shouldn't be a defensive one-hit wonder. You should just be like, bam, bam, bam. All these ideas that are just flowing from your mind. And your job security is because you are just thinking of so many ideas that you're always like a generation or two ahead of anybody that's going to copy you. And, you and, and that way, if you get bored with something, like for instance, push sticks, if some Chinese company decides to copy my push sticks, that's fine. I would like that because they are now making something that I think should be in the world and it should be cheaper and they can compete with me and make it cheaper and then I can move on to something else, maybe making like decorative battery holders or something. And I just don't like the idea of making one good idea and then patenting it. Kind of like uh, what Elon Musk says about SpaceX, where you need to make the machine to build the machine instead of just focusing on building the machine. You have to get the the innovation machine going. And then also this is a bit redundant, but you really have to do a good job where if you have an idea that really will help the world, it's your duty to help spread it. Because if you invent a way to have a light bulb that is very efficient um, and it could help people in in poor countries light their their living rooms at night or uh, they could cook with it or whatever then it's it is kind of your duty since you're now the holder of that idea to make sure that goodness spreads to the world now, I'm not saying you shouldn't profit from it but like if some other company comes up to you and and they're like hey that, that is a really good idea do you want to help manufacturing it I can see like that would be a good thing to spread it. So that's just one thought I have because it's more important that the good idea spreads than you like trying to keep some ownership over it. And this last one is a bit of a, well, it's a bit of an introspection about rules. I kind of call these structures instead because they're not quite rules but if I have, if I ever feel like one of these rules is confining me. It only takes me a few, a, a few minutes and I introspect and I realize it's actually an issue with something else like there's some some greed or like like well what if I wanted to have um, company secrets and uh, well you know why would I have that? I could just tell them because I, I, I shouldn't worry I shouldn't be so paranoid so if there's any like um, secret processes that I develop or whatever you know, I shouldn't even have those because those would be kind of based on greed. And now this is also a bit of a personal note. Not really well worded, so I'll brush over it. But I think a lot of people, they focus too much on the reward for work whenever you need other things. And if you just, for, if you just work on work, you're not going to be creative. Because you need to be inspired by life to have the right like artistic output with your engineering. Because engineering is an art. It's not a science, it's an art. I mean, it, it is kind of a science, but it's uh, it's like practiced art. It's um, it, it has to, uh, you should be making things that are beautiful. And in order to do that, you need to experience other things in life. You need to use your the things that you're making and you need to make sure they're, they're, they're right. And lastly, just a reminder, because I have this dream of having my own little store, like a junk store, uh, because uh, now me and Thais are in the Philadelphia area, and there's a few little shops that are go for sale every so often. If I ever saved up money, I could buy a store that could be a recycling center, or I could have this thing where I could have arcade machines out front, and anybody could come and play them, and then a little further back would be a little area where you'd have stuff that I've restored and repaired, and... 
I wouldn't limit myself to money. If somebody really, really needed something, I'd probably be like, eh, take it. Who cares? You can put a lot of good use to it, and you don't have much money. But, also if somebody came in and they were like, I really like that Nintendo, but all I have is 57 2x4s and a piece of plywood, well, I'm going to be like, that's good as money to me, because... You shouldn't limit yourself to thinking of money. That's why I'm also thinking about allowing people to pop, to buy my products on Etsy with Dogecoin. I'm not really sure how that'll work, but again, we, we shouldn't have this fixation, this fixation on money or seeing objects as money. I don't know. Just some thoughts I thought I'd tell you guys. I've been making videos, but I've been making it on all my other channels here and there, like... I painted my VR headset, and that'll be a video that'll be coming up pretty soon. But I'll go ahead and edit a video that I had thrown away, and I put on my archive drive. So here's that video. This is a really nice spot. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Covered bridge and everything. Okay, don't the camera. So. I have a lot of crazy viewers, and I kind of wanted to not hint too much of where we moved to, but it is in the Philadelphia area. And, you know, there's a difference, there's, there's a fine line to meet where you don't tell your address, but you don't have to keep it a secret. But I, I, I kind of felt like keeping it a secret, but ah, I'm just too excited about the area. Because I look at this, this is nice. Welcome to Philadelphia. <laughs> so, we, uh, one thing that I've noticed is there really aren't, um, the stores suck here, kind of, because they're hardware stores. We keep going into them. They don't have what we want. They're all tiny. Even Home Depot, like, most of the stuff is just out of stock or they don't even carry it. And it's almost harder to find stuff here, in a way, because, like, in Illinois, I know of all of these little junk shops and stuff, but out here, most of the, like, there aren't that many junk shops. But we found one. This is why I originally threw this video away, because we totally did not know what the name of the place was. It's the Gradyville Den of Antiquities. And we did a quick Google search, and we came up with something totally wrong, which is some store across the, the county. And... I was not really that happy about this video and whenever I noticed that we got the name wrong of where we told people that we got this good stuff from, I just got annoyed and I just deleted the video, deleted the work files and put everything on my archive drive and that's why I'm re-editing this, but uh, Gradyville Den of Antiquities. We went in and it looked like something I'm familiar with, where there's just a lot of stuff and I like that. and. The, uh, I think he's the owner, came in, and he was really nice and gave me some good deals and stuff because, you know, it's one of those places where if they don't like you, they'll probably raise the price because there's not price tags on most stuff. But because I made myself really likable, he gave me like half off and stuff. It was like really nice. Probably the kind of place you, you, you could probably bring stuff to sell there too. Like if I wanted to get into selling antiques out here, you know. So, I got some goodies. Paid 40 bucks for them. He gave me a real good deal. Got this blowtorch. I don't know what brand it is. I think it's the same brand as my, uh, my, uh, my old one that I call Gary. And then, got this alcohol length torch. I've never seen one like this. It's like a portable Bunsen burner. Excited about that. And he had some end mills and I, I decided to go with getting one of them. Casio TV 400 with dead batteries in it. And last but not least, a plane.
What do you think about that? So, one thing caught me off guard was that, so the prices are a lot lower than a lot of the thrift shops I've been to in the area. Like one, one thrift shop I went to, they had a calculator for like 10 bucks. It was garbage. But here, they offered like three bucks for in mills and stuff. And I was even hemming and hawing about, about getting this. And then he was like, ah, just take it. You can pay me later. And I'm like, oh, well, well, gosh, I'll just buy it now. But he had 15 written on it, and then he was like, nah, seven bucks. It's like, okay, well, that's definitely the kind of place you want to go to because you can actually make a friend with the owner. I, I mean, don't expect to get that kind of deal, but it made a good impression on me. A real good impression. Hey, you want to go check out the... I do. Yeah, I, I kind of... So we have a secret channel running where we... We've been filming uh, videos about the architecture and stuff. And uh, maybe someday we'll let you guys know. But we want to do that whenever we have some a good series yeah. and a good like formula. Because we want mm -hmm. that to evolve on its own. Because it has like two subscribers. <laughs> it has eight. Eight? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so that might be like in a few years we'll talk about that or a few months. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm thinking the, the format for this video can be, uh, well, we start in the park, we'll look around a little bit, and then we'll go back home and we'll mess with these things. Yeah. Put some fuel in them. There you go. Yeah. I really like this step down here. Like, it's actually quite a bit. You don't notice in a video how 3D and rolling these hills are. It's really quite cute. You know, I don't think I've ever been on a covered bridge before. Me neither. Yeah. Let's go. I really like that. Didn't you see that one? Let's go home and torch something. Preferably not my eyebrows. Yeah. So I did my normal treatment where I, I take the piston, which the leather is a bit old and it, it's not holding its shape too well. And I put a little bit of uh, oil on it, just some random oil that was in the garage. And it's doing a little better, but it's just not holding air too well. So we might not get this one working. Now this one, this Link alcohol torch, I cannot find any video of this running online. So we'll do a video now. This should be pretty easy to do, but I should probably revisit that later because I can't find any evidence of how it works. So that could be very worth documenting. These blow lamps have been all over YouTube. As for that, I had this that I found in the trash, but unfortunately it's like a gel. It does have some liquid though. I don't think it's going to hurt the torch though, so we can use that.
see if that works or if it spews. Okay, good. So you had to remove all this stuff that was inside the thing. I don't know what that was about. One of the sirens. This flame's gonna be really messy while this is burning off the rest in that trough. So let that burn down. I think we got a good deal with this. Yeah. And there's still a few more of these there, if anybody yeah. wants to go get them. There's at least two. Yep. Yeah, that's a bit much. I don't know what that is, but. There we go. So that's a much nicer flame there. That's more like it. I doubt this thing's gotten fired up in at least 10 years, maybe longer. So, I haven't had one that ha that's had such a, a short, fat burn chamber, because it seems like the chamber kind of starts like right here. And it seems like the ones that I have that are a little bit older maybe, uh, they're longer and narrower, and those seem like they, they handle wind a little bit better, but still, it's really good. Today's a really windy day though. Put it back on this. When we get our apartment and have I have my workbench all set up, we can see about fixing this up. And I released all the pressure, so now the system is not pressurized. Whenever you cool, whenever you let one of these cool down, though, remember to open this, otherwise the valve will contract around it and you could break your handle on doing it. Now, the Lenk Manufacturing Company, I believe it's Newton, Massachusetts, I saw another label for that, Alcohol Torch. Okay, so we have a cap. We have this thing which I don't understand. I have another Lenk blowtorch and it has other things that I don't understand, so it might be a piece missing. So we have this stuff, which is basically like, it's like solid fuel, but there's some liquid in there. So I'm gonna try something kind of tricky. Screw it, I guess that works. Gosh, uh, ethanol has pretty good surface tension, doesn't it? Is that like a thing it has? No idea. actually worked out pretty well. We're up to about here now. More than enough for my tastes. I don't want a whole bunch of fuel in my hands, literally.
Maybe with that rod spool, it's just if you, when you want to put the flame out. Yeah. It's connected to the cap. That could be. So you could do it carefully. So I'm going to. Actually, you know what? No. I don't have any neat suit oil on me, but I found that putting a bit of oil, like whether it be engine oil or what, can actually help seal stuff. So. Hey, it's actually sealing. You recording? Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, it's actually sealing. Well, that worked. I don't want to do it too much. Like, I wouldn't set it sideways, but... Can I get some ethanol to come out, I wonder? Let's see if we should get anything. That was weird. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. I feel like it's just charring itself, though. Yeah. It's not quite all there. That fuel isn't raw ethanol, so whatever this stuff is, it might just not be good for that. So maybe I should get some actual ethanol for the actual video. Oh yeah, and I forgot. We also got this. I don't see where it says who it was made by, but it just says made in the USA, so it might be something generic. But, um, this could be really nice. Plus this end mill. You know, they had bigger ones there. I can't remember if I said this or not, but they had bigger ones there. This was Whitman and Barnes, Plymouth, Michigan. I just got the half inch one and left the other one. So there's still a bunch more. There's still a couple more. Not, not a bunch, but there's a couple more end mills still at that place too. And to finish off this video, I had hoped to have this TV working, but... Even though I'm in the city now, and well, at least I'm okay around the city, within range of getting signal, it just nope. This has succumbed to the capacitor issues of uh, well, pretty much all of these seem to have that. Oh, this is gonna be a pain in the butt to get this thing working because I have to open it up. I open it up, and there are literal like corrosion crystals that I could pick off of components. It is just nasty none of the controls do anything evidently this is just what happens to these it's unfortunate just kind of goes to show that the older something is after a certain point it seems like it works more like those torches worked fine just like put well the ethanol was kind of a bad fuel it was probably it's meant for like heating food not for burning rapidly but the gasoline worked fine um, it's just a shame that electronics don't always last too well. Hope you guys enjoyed this video and thank you very much for watching. See ya. Can you hear my sheep? <laughs>